Okay, welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar. Uh, we're uh, going to hear from three panelists. We have with us uh, Matt Veach, a state archivist from the Kansas Historical Society, Kathy Popovich, a records uh, archivist from the Illinois State Archivist, and Chris Denson, uh, administrator from the Oregon Records Management Solution at the Oregon State Archives. Uh, the procedure today will be for each of the presenters to uh, speak to you, and then they're going to turn their mics over to the next presenter. We're going to hold all questions until the end. So right now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Matt. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, yeah, my name is Matt Veach. I am the state archivist in Kansas. I uh, actually work at the Kansas Historical Society. Uh, I've been involved with the Council of State Archivists for quite a number of years. And in fact, I was uh, the president of the organization uh, back in 2015. Uh, as you can see from my <clears throat> my photo there, um, I do have a little gray hair, and so I'm uh, I've been around quite some time in this field. I didn't put any dates on uh, on my career path, but just just know that I have uh, I've been at the Kansas Historical Society for 25 years, so I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, so a little bit about my education and training and my career path. Uh, I come up kind of uh, kind of a more traditional route. Uh, a lot of the, the folks are now uh, that I'm hiring are now coming out of library science or information science programs, school of information programs. But I came up in the in the old days when just a master's degree in history was kind of the uh, oftentimes the um, the card, the, the the piece of paper that you needed to get a job in uh, in archives in state archives. Uh, I got on the job training. I became a certified archivist uh, fairly early, early in my career. That is a, a certification program that uh, is available to archivists, and, and I felt like it was a, a valuable thing for me. Um, I had a, a fairly straightforward career path. I started at uh, a local or county historical society over in Independence, Missouri. I uh, worked half time. I made a, a grand total of $10,000 a year for one full year. That's all the time my wife allowed me to work half time. And fortunately for me, uh, the Missouri State Archives hired me right at that 12 month mark. Uh, I worked there for 18 months, came to the Kansas Historical Society in 1992, uh, became the state archivist in 2006, and I am still here and plan to retire from the Kansas Historical Society. So that's just a little bit about my background. We'll go ahead to the, to the next slide. Now I'm just going to, I want to just set the scene for you, kind of set the stage for um, my two colleagues who will talk a little bit more about the, the day in and day out work of what it means to work in a state archives or in a government archives. But I'm going to start with the very basics and, and that is uh, what is a state archives? What are state archives? Um, most, you know, most simply, most fundamentally, state archives are a repository, the repository for state government records that have enduring value, permanent value, permanent archival value. They need to be retained for, uh, in, in, our, in our view of, the, of things, for the life of the republic. Um, state archives, uh, historically speaking, emerged in the early 20th century. Um, there were, there were something, you know, there were essentially repositories for government records, for state government records in many states. But there, the official, statutorily created state archives emerged early in the 1900s, and uh, by the middle part of the century, uh, most every state had one. One important thing, one important point to make about a government archives, in particular, uh, you know, state government, federal federal archives, is that we we don't store, we don't house all of the records created by a government. So uh, the general rule of thumb is we want to take less than 5% of records that produced by the government, less than 5% of them are deemed to have enduring value. And most, um, most fundamentally in the 21st century uh, is that format absolutely does not matter. Uh, you'll see the, the, the photo that I took, uh, the piece of art that, um, that one of my colleagues made with all of the old technology from, from mice to CDs to, um, to you know, Kindle devices. You can see that uh, digital material is something that is uh, kind of dominating our field right now. There's a fair amount of variation across states and territories with regard to the organization and the funding of, of their state archives. Uh, administratively, in terms of like where the state archives is located within the government itself, it, it varies quite a bit. 
Uh, sometimes they're independent agencies. Um, very often they're in Secretary of State's offices. So the state of California or the state of Missouri, for example, are both in Secretary of State's offices. Uh, sometimes they're in a historical society, like, like in Kansas or Ohio or Minnesota. Uh, cultural resources or cultural affairs agencies are also uh, a likely place to find the state archives. Uh, and sometimes they're combined with a state library like they are in Kentucky or Texas or Florida. So, so it does vary quite a bit across the states. Um, and there's also a fair amount of, of variation in terms of funding and staffing across states and territories. And so you'll find um, you'll find state archives like in Kansas, uh, you know, relatively low population state like Kansas or Nebraska or the Dakotas. Uh, we get by with a very small number of staff uh, and, a, and a relatively small budget. Uh, you go to some of the larger states, uh, you know, the North Carolinas and the New Yorks and uh, the Californias of the world, and sometimes their their staffs are quite a bit larger. Generally, it's it, the staff staffing will will range from as I suppose as small as one, say a territory. I, I used to work with or talk to quite a bit the uh, the, the archivist for the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, that's a that's a territory for those of you who didn't know, um, and he he was a one person shop. Uh, but you know it varies from from one to a few dozen people. Very few state archives are are really really large organizations. There's also variation in the sense that um, in in some state archives uh, they have responsibility for records management, um, meaning that that they work with state and local government agencies to help them help them you know with the active management of records in their offices. And we've generally found that if uh, records management programs and state archives programs are combined, you often get the best results. Uh, it's it's kind of a they're kind of a, <clears throat> a symbiotic relationship between those two things uh, with records management kind of helping us identify those records that ultimately need to come to the archives and you identify it very early in the records life cycle. Um, but it doesn't doesn't have to be that way. And there are some states uh, that don't have records management as part of the state archives and yet they still operate very, very fine programs. Uh, there's also variation in terms of uh, responsibility for local government records. Um, many states have um, have responsibility for or are at least very active in providing uh, records management and, and archives consulting services or, or providing advice and assistance to county governments or municipal governments or you know, school districts or water districts, you know, any kind of local local government entity. And there are some states, uh, you know, 20 or so states that actively collect and, and store local government records with enduring value. And again, that just kind of kind of varies across the states, kind of depends on uh, what their, uh, how they got founded and what their funding is like and what their staffing is like. And go to the next slide, please. So why would someone want to work in a state archives? And that's that's kind of the one of the main uh, thrusts of this presentation is to try and and explain um, why it's a re it really is a, a meaningful and uh, uh, it's a diverse and meaningful place to work. I um, I think sometimes uh, we sell ourselves short and we we tend to not have quite the Oh, the level of panache that, say, uh, you know, a, a university setting would have uh, special collections in, in, in a university. Often people like that academic environment, and I certainly understand that and appreciate what, uh, what those kinds of, of programs bring. But I, I'm very partial to, uh, to state archives, to government archives, and I really feel like some of the most important uh, archival work uh, in the in the country is is taking place right in the state archives, and I think you'll you would find if you would if you would join a program uh, like the one that I have here in Kansas or the one in Illinois or the one in Oregon or anywhere in the country that you would have a really diverse and meaningful experience. You get to do a lot of different things, um, and you'll see that list there. I mean, it, and it, that can go on and on. I mean, you get to do all parts. You get to engage in all parts of the archival enterprise. Um, appraisal, uh, I always like to talk about when I'm talking to people about uh, what it's like and what it means to, to work in a state archives by talking about appraisal and emphasizing the, the you know, kind of the, 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 my view that that's kind of the most important thing that government archivists do, uh, government archivists and records managers. 
Um, you know, and it's because of the fact that we don't bring everything in that's created by government. If we're going to eliminate 95% of the records created by a state government, then we better be very careful about deciding which 5% is worthy of making it to the archives. How do you make those decisions? And, and those are the kinds of things that uh, in, in a government archives, in a state archives, you often get to participate in that process and make those really essential decisions uh, for, the, for the future of, of the state and of the country. But you also get to do lots of the other of the traditional um, archival activities like arrangement and description and reference and outreach and education. You might get to work on an exhibit. Uh, but increasingly, um, a, a, the focus of so much of our attention is on electronic records management, digital preservation, uh, trying to make sure that, the, that the, the digital materials that are being created today by our, our state governments uh, are being managed and preserved properly. So that's uh, my, my pitch there is uh, in terms of why you as a, as a young person or perhaps not so young person uh, just coming out of school, why you might pursue uh, work in a state archive is just from the archival perspective is that <clears throat> you really get to do diverse things and what you do makes a real difference. And that comes to the, to the point of, of a state archives being a fundamental cornerstone of our form of government, of, of a Republican government. <laughs> You can't have accountability or transparency um, without records of the activities of your government. Uh, uh, we, we serve to preserve cultural memory. And, and one of the things that I think that I always like to emphasize is just the, the critical role that a state archives plays in securing, securing. Uh, securing rights, civil rights, property rights, whether we have land records or it could be employment records or medical records, environmental records. There's just a wide array of, of essential government records that serve as kind of the underpinnings for our democracy. So you can go forward. So who are we looking for? What kinds of people do we are are we trying to hire in the state archives? Um, you know, we're we're looking we're looking for a few good archivists interested in changing the world. Um, I'm you know I, I'm I'm very serious about that. I mean you know it, it might sound kind of uh, kind of hokey, but uh, I really do believe that what we're doing matters. That some of the most interesting and and important records to be managed are in state archives, and we're looking for good people to help us with this endeavor. Now the the challenges are immense. The staffing levels aren't what they should be. The funding levels aren't what they should be. Um, but uh, we're looking for people who are, who are interested in, in doing work that really makes a difference in society. We're also looking for people who are lifelong learners who, Im who um, embrace change. Uh, this is not the kind of profession, uh, I, don't, I don't care where you are really, uh, in, in anywhere in archives, but particularly in state archives, uh, you have to stay fresh, you have to, to stay current, uh, you, you need to be devoted and, and, uh, and committed to professional development. Without it, uh, the world will pass you by very, very quickly. Um, you know, just as and as, as an example, I mean, you saw that I had a I have a master's degree in history. Um, that's what I, I figured. If I went into archives, I'd get to uh, I'd get to work with some of the archival materials that I became so familiar with in doing my master's work. Uh, and all of that was either paper based or microfilm. And yet, I've spent most of the last 25 years thinking about uh, managing electronic records or in and uh, preserving those digital records over time. That's not the kind of thing that I I really thought I was going to get involved in. But uh, because I was very willing to to learn the new skills and, and keep abreast of the new developments, I uh, was able to keep up and it's uh, it's really exciting to be part of this. We're also looking, as I've, I've, I've emphasized electronic records or digital records an awful lot, um, I look for, uh, for, for people who are, are either digital natives, um, partic you know, particularly the younger people we're hiring today, but, uh, but others who are at least very comfortable with technology. Uh, I don't think a, a state archives career is really a good place for someone who is, uh, is not very comfortable uh, with uh, information technology. And then finally, uh, we're looking for, for people who are dynamic, outward facing people people. Um, I really try to um, you know, get, dissuade people of the idea that, um, that archivists spend all of their time in the stacks 
in quiet rooms, just sorting papers, that you do have your quiet moments, but so much of what state archives are about right now are looking outside of our walls, uh, providing training, providing consulting services, providing education to K through 12. There's so many opportunities and so much need for us to be outward looking, to be um, outgoing people uh, and interested in interacting with others. Without that, we just cannot achieve, uh, the, achieve our goals. All right, so the final slide. Um, I just wanted, I just have, uh, I asked one of my, well, I asked several of my staff members to, uh, to kind of tell me why they thought it would be worthwhile, why they think it's worthwhile to work in the state archives. This is my, uh, one of my most recent hires, um, my electronic records archivist, Megan Rolletter. She gave me permission to use that photo. She's looking inside a box very cautiously, uh, a transfer of records from, uh, from our governor's office. We're in the process of, of working through identifying all of those records and making some sense out of them. But you can see her statement here that uh, you get to handle some of the coolest materials uh, that are invaluable to your state and its legacy. And in the time that she's been here, she's seen, seen the state's constitution, a large collection of territorial Kansas records, records from the office of our state governor, countless photographs, maps, and drawings. She's held letters by Abraham Lincoln and Aaron Burr and seen diaries written by Carrie Nation and Samuel Reeder. And this is my favorite part. She says, yes, you will even get, you will get goosebumps. Yes, you may even get a little misty, but it makes it all worth it. So that's my Megan. I uh, really, I, I love her passion. And, uh, and I think uh, if, you, if you chose to join the State Archives, you would, you would feel similarly. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we have our second panelist for today. Kathy, I'll uh, give the mic to you. My name is Kathy Popovich, uh, and I work at the Illinois State Archives. Um, to start off my section of this talk, um, I want to give a, a little bit of background about me first um, and my motivations for entering the archival field uh, and how I ended up working in a government archives. Um, and then I'll take you through what I do here and uh, hopefully you'll find something in this talk that appeals to you um, and maybe you'll consider a career in state archives. Uh, so I have a bachelor's degree in history. Um, I originally was an education major. Um, I went through all of the internship hours and I got into, I think I was about two weeks into uh, the student teaching and a light bulb went off and I realized that uh, teaching just wasn't, wasn't for me. I wasn't cut out for it. Um, so much to my parents' dismay, uh, I, I dropped the education component of my degree um, and really I had no idea what I was going to do moving forward, um, which was a little bit terrifying, to be honest. Um, but I knew I was still interested in finding a career uh, in which I could facilitate learning um, and provide educational opportunities for others. Um, I really loved the one-on-one -on -one interactions with my students, um, connecting with them and finding ways to teach to them um, and to um, uh, connect them with their interests. So moving forward, I knew that would be a, a key aspect of any career that I would consider. Um, another thing I was looking for was variety. Uh, after college for a little while, I uh, scored standardized uh, writing tests. So for about four, for 40 hours a week, uh, I sat at a computer, read a sentence or two, and punched in a score, and um, quickly learned that uh, that wasn't for me. Um, I, it, you know, don't get me wrong, I sometimes appreciate hiding behind a computer all day, um, but I knew that I needed to go into a field that got me interacting with people, um, and I guess just working different parts of my brain. Um, and finally, I, I wanted a job where I would constantly be growing, learning new things and new skills. So I, uh, I started volunteering at a public library, actually. Um, and in doing that, I, I saw the potential for a career in some form of information management field. Um, so I decided to go back to school. Uh, I got my master's degree in library and information science from the University of Illinois. Um, and I specialized in special collections. After uh, getting my master's, I worked for um, an engineering firm here in Springfield. 
Uh, I was uh, the solo librarian for the firm and all of its branch offices. Um, and towards the end of my time there, I also helped them start, <coughs> excuse me, um, start building their records management policies and procedures and kind of improving on those. Um, so going into that job, um, I wasn't really sure that was the right job for me. Um, so I guess this will be my first tip of the day. Don't be afraid to take a job that you're unsure about or um, that you think isn't 100% of what you're looking for. Uh, being a solo librarian and doing basically everything, I learned a lot and gained uh, some really valuable experience. Um, and at the very least, I learned that I didn't really want to be a librarian. Um, and I also learned, discovered that I didn't really want to work in the private sector, uh, which is something I had never really thought about before. Um, I found that I wanted to be able to help a more uh, excuse me, a diverse group of people um, and feel like I was making an impact on my community and my state more directly. Um, so kind of by word of mouth, um, I learned about the uh, Illinois State Archives and their internship program. Um, I, I applied, I uh, you know, went through the whole uh, interview process and was hired in August of 2014. And the internship program, uh, it's designed as a one-year internship uh, where you spend time in each unit of the archives, kind of uh, learning the ropes of that unit um, and how all of the different sections work together. So I, uh, I interned for six months, and then I was hired as a records archivist in March of 2015. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Matt talked a lot about um, the variations across the state and territorial archives. So here's just a little overview um, about um, the archives in Illinois. We are a department under the Secretary of State. Um, we were established initially as a division of the Illinois State Library. And then in 1957, um, Illinois passed the State Records Act. Uh, we became our own department uh, underneath the Secretary of State. Um, we hold government records for all three branches of state government, and we only collect government records. Um, in Illinois, the uh, Lincoln Presidential Library, um, that's our state's historical library, and they accept family papers, diaries, manuscripts, um, but we only take official state government records. Um, within the archives, we have Seven different units. Um, administrative unit is our director, our personnel liaison, our fiscal officer, um, the operations and reference uh, unit. They accession records into the archives and provide reference services. We also have a unit called the IRAD, which is the Illinois Regional Archives Depository. Um, and they, um, at seven regional universities throughout the state, um, staff at the university and graduate student interns run a regional archive, which consists of local government records. <clears throat> um, I'll talk about the publications unit a little bit later because that's where I work. We also have a conservation lab. We have a records management unit that works with state and local agencies um, to set retention schedules. We also have a micrographics unit that microfilms and scans documents, photos um, for the archives and for other state agencies. Um, and so I'm showing, showing you this to also demonstrate that there are a lot of different opportunities within state archives. Uh, so the chances are pretty high that your particular skill set and your interests can be put to good use in the state archives. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, I currently work in the Publications and Finding Aids Unit. Um, it meets a lot of my criteria that I mentioned earlier um, in that I'm able to do a lot of different things, meet and work with a lot of different people. Uh, it provides opportunities for me to help people find what they're looking for or to learn something new. Um, and I'm constantly learning new things about our state, about um, the archival field and developing new skills. Uh, we put out a newsletter three times a year. Uh, we usually highlight a document or collection, which requires me to do some research. Um, some of our most recent articles we've done have been on uh, 
the excavation of the Cahokia Mounds in Southern Illinois. Um, let's see the history of our penitentiary system, the expansion of um, highways in the 1920s. So again, constantly learning about things that I, you know, never really would have thought to learn about. Um, we create and distribute document teaching packets on different subjects related to Illinois history. Uh, we have different flyers and brochures um, about the archives and doing research with our collections. But probably the most important work that our unit does is the processing, um, the arrangement and description. Um, the operation section accessions the materials, but um, before they can be used or um, made available to the public, we have to do the arrangement and description um, to provide that intellectual access. So here's, here's one very important way that the work we do um, really helps to advance government transparency um, and to aid our users, uh, but again, by providing that access point with our descriptions. Um, I would say this is the part of the job that is a little bit more secluded. Um, so if that kind of work appeals to you, um, there are definitely opportunities for positions that don't have quite as much public interaction. Um, but as Matt mentioned earlier, um, it's very rare that you will have no interaction with others. Um, another duty I have is that I represent the state archives at history and genealogy conferences and symposia in the state. Um, so in that way, I'm kind of our de facto outreach person. Um, and again, this is another opportunity for me to meet a diverse group of people, talk with them about our collections, and hopefully get them to the materials that will be useful to them. Um, I am not really much of a talker, but I love hearing people's stories, and going to these conferences provides a great opportunity for that. Um, people love sharing their stories, their family histories, um, or the research that they're doing, and it's it's really invigorating uh, to be around groups of people that are so passionate about their work and their interests and getting to do these kind of things. You really get to see how the work that the archives does really impacts the people and the community that um, you're working for. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, um, Around here, we kind of joke about the ominous other duties as assigned responsibility in all of our official job descriptions. And uh, this is the area that really brings a lot of variety to the work that I do. Um, I serve as the deputy coordinator for the Illinois State Historical Records Advisory Board, or the ISHRAB. Um, this is a statewide board, um, which serves as a review, review excuse me, a review body for uh, records, grant proposals submitted to the NHPRC, um, which is the grant making agency affili affiliated with the National Archives. Um, the ISHRAB runs its own grant program for smaller projects in the state and provides a lot of opportunities for archival professional development. Um, and in working with this board, um, again, I get to work with archivists in a lot of different types of institutions. So um, board members themselves, um, we have members from university archives, um, business archives, genealogists, um, we have professors, um, and then also in um, kind of running the grant and scholarship programs, I get to connect with um, other archivists throughout the state and um, even people who are performing archival work but who aren't archivists. Um, so it's a great opportunity to really see what's going on throughout our state. Um, I do a lot with grant management, um, whether that be writing grant proposals for projects at the archives um, or helping with the administrative side of grants that we've uh, received. Um, so if you're looking for another skill to gain, grant writing is um, a really good skill to have. Um, I serve as our department's liaison to the Secretary of State's Communications Department. So um, anytime somebody needs business cards printed, um, forms updated or printed, that goes through me. And then I also give the occasional group, group or class tour uh, of our building. If you're ever in Springfield, come visit us because it's a very beautiful building. <laughs> Lots of history there. Um, and that pretty much sums up what I do. Um, I feel very lucky to be where I am. Um, it's, 
it's definitely not all sunshine and rainbows. I mean, we we do, after all, work for the government. So um, that sometimes means that we have to jump through a lot of hoops to get certain things accomplished. Um, really similar to probably any other archival institution, we're constantly having to advocate for ourselves and uh, educate others on the importance of the work that we do. Um, we have to deal with the growing idea or expectation rather that everything should be digital and um, available um, on the internet. Um, paper cuts are a daily threat, <laughs> uh, but it really is very meaningful and important work. Um, Matt talked about some of this earlier, but uh, state archives are looking for people who are adaptable to change, who are flexible, willing to learn, um, you know, forward thinking and creative. Um, so if this sounds like you and you're passionate about uh, government transparency um, and connecting people with their government and their history, um, I encourage you to consider a career in state or, or other government archives. Um, and that's all I have today. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. And now I'm going to turn the mic over to our uh, third speaker for today, Chris. So uh, my name is Chris Stenson. Uh, I am the administrator for the Oregon Records Management Solution for the Oregon State Archives, and I will explain what that is in just a second. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, you'll probably hear some of the same concepts you've heard uh, from Matt and Kathy uh, in my section here, um, and that's not because we all uh, shared notes and said we were going to hammer the same tact, same aspects. It's just that uh, certain themes will tend to come up, uh, you know. At the same time, um, so I'm kind of called my little section. I'm gonna get a little subtitle for it. I, I have a tendency to like cutesy little titles for things. So I'm calling my talk here "All Roads Lead from Rome." Um, of course, that's the opposite of the traditional phrase. Uh, or how to be an ARM professional in a world that won't stop changing. So I'm gonna use the term as a catch-all. So archives and records management professionals, um, you just by virtue of being uh, in working on your uh, MLISs or other uh, variations of those degrees at the time you are right now, I'm sure you're aware of the rapidly changing terminology that is utilized surrounding the worlds of, of archives and records management, um, information management, information governance, all those different concepts that are interlinked and interconnected. And if you put 12 people in a room, they will all disagree as to what they all exactly mean. Um, I am notorious for running afoul of precise language on this because I tend to prefer uh, looser, colloquial terms that actually mean something to people. So in this case, I've chosen to use ARM as a, as a shorthand for all of the various aspects of work that surround basically dealing with uh, managing and preserving records um, for short term, long term and everything in between. Um, so and I've got uh, some little images there. So we've got a succession of formats uh, that we see here. Um, this is something I often use with out external outreach. So we've got a cuneiform tablet. So um, and this also serves as a uh, sort of demonstration of the longevity and the shrinking longevity of the sort of records we work with and the challenges we face. So cuneiform tablets, um, some of them are 6,000 years old or so, uh, we can still read them, they're still around. Uh, papyrus, similarly, uh, had been around for millennia. Uh, paper, for not all that much less, uh, still static. Then we get up to digital formats like a Word document, which has been around, well, a Word document hasn't necessarily, but, but uh, word processing documents have existed for a couple decades, two, three decades at most. Um, and then we're already sort of moving into a world now where um, ever, ever more uh, folks are working in much more dynamic platforms. They're not uh, dealing with static forms anymore. We're dealing with uh, complex software systems that contain information in lots of different ways and the records may or may not exist as discrete forms anymore. And these are the sort of challenges that, uh, that we're, all, we're all looking at. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, a little bit about me. So as I mentioned, um, I, uh, I am currently uh, working for the Oregon State Archives, but I have a history going back to uh, when I was an undergrad at Washington State University. Um, and I got an um, undergrad in uh, history with an anthropology minor. And, uh, and then I got a master's in Roman history from the same institution. So um, clearly, hence the, the Roman reference in the first slide there. Um, Clearly, that is not a degree uh, that is replete with job opportunities. Um, so those of you that have other liberal arts degrees and came to this, you may have, I feel my pain in this and that, uh, what do you know, I have this degree because that's what I like to do, but it did not immediately uh, turn into a bevy of job offers. Um, 
so I kind of struggled after my master's, um, sort of just did work, regular old work, worked for a cell phone company for a number of years, um, and reached the inevitable conclusion that I couldn't keep going on like this. I needed to find something else. Now, I had, um, in my time at Washington State, worked uh, at the uh, at the university archives for a time, uh, doing some processing of collections and things like that. Uh, and that was actually my first introduction to the existence of a degree known as a uh, an MLS. Uh, so the idea of a, of a specific degree that was not a PhD, that was uh, for folks pursuing this area. So it was kind of new to me at that time. Um, I went back to that thinking and decided it was, it was high time for me to go on and do it. Um, so I packed up all my stuff uh, and uh, with my with my new wife and we we went off across the country to Indiana to to go to Indiana University um, to do to pursue my my master's in library science. Um, I wanted to do I wanted to do something uh, different and get out there and, and I don't regret that decision. Uh, but it was a long long drive. Um, so there I focused on an archives track. So I did of course the usual array of of classes, but focused specifically on archives track and. The head of the archives there was very much focused on the next generation of archival work, which was electronic essentially. Um, and so I got a tremendous amount of experience and, and drive from that in terms of understanding areas in which there was going to be a need in the field. Um, so uh, I did work and uh, through that, and this is, this is gonna be a little bit of a lesson that I loop back to later, but through that job, uh, working with the University Arch Archivist, uh, a man named Phil Banton, who did some work for COSA as part of a large, uh, a large uh, interstate survey of uh, the state of electronic records in the United States, um, had done some work and then heard about an opening at the Illinois State Archives. And when I just recently graduated uh, with my MLS, uh, and so uh, Illinois State Archives, one state over. Uh, and so that is how I heard about the job there, um, got the introduction and uh, was able to get the job as electronic records archivist for the Illinois State Archives. So actually, Kathy and I were co-workers uh, for about a year before I, before I moved on. Um, so in my role there, uh, I can tell you right out the gates, I showed up and was, said, oh, and was told, you're the expert. You tell us what to do with this electronic stuff. Uh, that is an intimidating thing, I will tell you that. Uh, it was exciting. Uh, it was something uh, to be looked at as the expert was a little daunting, but the reality is, and this is sort of, uh, the, re the reality is, is this is still a, an area where um, there is a need for that sort of field. So, so there was a lot of expertise in more traditional aspects of archival work. There was not a lot of expertise uh, at that institution at the time um, in the realm of electronic records. So I uh, did a lot of outreach and education. I traveled the state, basically I, I did my preacher on a donkey routine where I just go to any government entity that wanted to talk and talk to them about how they were managing their electronic records. Um, to this day, you'll note my title at the time was archivist. So those that want to talk about a real strict uh, definition between records management and archives, um, I don't really see it that way. And at the time I didn't either. Uh, the idea is that I blended areas of the thing. I talked about digital preservation, but I also talked about active records management. Um, both are sides of the same coin. So that's a lot of what I did there, traveled around a lot helped draft new rules for the state, which was pretty exciting. So I, I helped draft rules that are still on the books there. Um, so while my name might not be on them, I know I did that. So that's a pretty cool thing. Um, from there, I was able to, uh, to move on to my uh, ancestral homeland, so to speak, uh, where I grew up, which is the Pacific Northwest, uh, and, and get back here to Oregon. There was an opportunity to lead, um, there's an opportunity to, to take charge of this really ambitious project called the Oregon Records Management Solution. Um, which is uh, a statewide initiative where we help facilitate electronic records management software uh, for government agencies, large and small. Um, when, I when I got here, we had somewhere about 30 client agencies, 25, 30 client agencies, and it was kind of, uh, we were needing to expand and, and, and do more work. I'm proud to say we've, we're up to 57 now. We've grown tremendously in the last few years, um, and it's, it's just been a very exciting project to be part of. Um, but has very much also strained my expertise. So I've had to learn constantly. Um, the sort of work I do is, is often not what you would uh, uh, consider archival work uh, in a traditional sense. Um, and as you've no doubt determined by now, I am also sort of a professional talker. Uh, this is often how I, I get my positions. So uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so keyword here, and this is sort of one thing I have uh, learned over time 
The key word is adaptability. And I mean that not only in uh, your own willingness to take on new challenges and explore new venues of work or opportunities, but also to um, be adaptable in terms of the way you do your work. So um, first of all, when I, what were my goals when I pursued uh, this field? Well, first of all, uh, steady employment. So having worked in a non-affiliated sector for a few years, uh, sort of feeling my soul slowly being crushed week after week, I knew I wanted something, first of all, that would give me steady employment in the field. I, I wanted to be able to work, so I learned my lesson from my MA. Um, I also wanted to do something that would drive the field forward. I wasn't interested in sort of just filling a place as people might have before, show up at a job, do the job and leave the job and, and have no real, uh, have no real uh, movement in that. I'm not interested in being static. And my third goal is I wanted to have a proactive and positive impact on society. Now there's lots of ways you can go about doing this. I wasn't necessarily uh, focused on a particular kind of institution or a particular kind of job, but I knew I wanted to have something that I would feel that I did something good uh, for other people, for society at large. And so by to, to do that, um, and this is something I always advise people, cast a very wide net. I will tell you point blank that those people, so when we gra graduated, I got my MLS uh, still in the heavy parts of the recession. It was not a great time for job searching. Um, it was a challenging time and it was 2011. And uh, I have a lot of friends and colleagues who struggled to find work for quite some time. It took me about six months to procure a full-time position at an archives, um, which was not too bad. Um, but I knew others that struggled for longer. And that's not to uh, sound negative. It's just that um, you, the ones that struggled the most, I think, were the ones that were trying to pigeonhole themselves, that were saying, I only want to work in this specific aspect of the field. I only want to work in this location. So casting a wide net, being open to new opportunities was the number one thing to give me an opportunity. I, I applied for all types of archival work because I didn't know what I'd be good at yet. And to that I say, so you don't know what you're good at until you try. So we all come out with our education. We've learned a wide variety of topics. Maybe we have some areas we really like and some that we're maybe less enthusiastic about but we haven't really had extensive experience in applying those skills. So we really don't know what it is we're gonna excel at. And so um, I always say, you know, look for all the types of opportunities that might be out there. Um, be persistent, of course, and this is, I, you know, I won't belabor this, but people know, uh, I sent out dozens upon dozens of resumes and got very little response back. And that is pretty typical. There's a lot out there. Um, I think it's probably better now than it was when I was searching. I hope it is, but it's always challenging and you can't get down on yourself. You have to just keep trying. Um, also, perfect opportunities are rare. You're rarely gonna find something that checks all your boxes. So what you do is, and this, I did this as well, I made a list of things that I was willing to try, things that I were hard no, which I tried to keep a small list, things that were hard no, whether it was a location or a type of work that I just didn't want one to do. Um, and then I had others where uh, I said, you know, that's good enough or ones that I really wanted. Um, but there are always opportunities. So uh, don't overlook the good enough one in you know, hoping for a perfect one because the perfect ones really don't exist uh, very often. It's very rare that you're gonna find yourself in that situation. Next slide, please. Okay, so it's good to be needed, right. So a lot of this is, I mean, there was a lot of discussion, I know when I was graduating um, a few years back about the, the or when I was in school was, the graying of the field, and that's not a pejorative term. It's simply saying that, you know, there was a large generation of archivists and records managers that were nearing the end of their careers. There were gonna be a lot of retirements imminent. Well, the recession kind of put a pause on that. So we saw a lot of folks that were going to retire, not retire, uh, hold on for another five or six or seven years as their pensions, you know, had problems or whether they could, you know, they couldn't make the numbers work. Um, so, uh, that expertise in still in large part is still around. We are starting to see a lot of those retirements and there is a need, um, but there are still a lot of those folks around. But what are they best at is often the more traditional aspects of the field. These are folks that are, they may be very gifted at manage, managing manuscript collections, at doing traditional appraisal work, um, at creating uh, handcrafted filing aid, finding aids with great amounts of detail. The sort of work um, that quite frankly is not the future of it. Um, they, and they need people, uh, they need people that can help drive that next generation of skills into their institutions. Um, state archi archives in particular, bear a huge responsibility for ensuring uh, government transparency and access to information. So uh, it's very important, they need people with these next generation skills because they are, uh, as Matt and Kathy alluded to, being, you know, we're getting the stuff, the stuff is coming to us. 
um, all manner of, of records from different types of agencies in whatever formats they may have been created in, these days overwhelmingly digital. And archives don't always have the tools in place and the expertise in place to handle that. So there is a great need uh, for folks to step in and take that role. Uh, and they really need skills that are not necessarily part of the traditional ARM toolkit. Now I know, um, I've talked to Pat and I know the program at SJU has done a great job in really driving uh, innovation in these next generation skills. So uh, that is important. Uh, and so as the others have said, um, these next generation skills that are not traditionally considered part of it are critical. So um, it's a big opportunity for folks coming into the field right now of making a difference, of setting themselves apart. And can tell you right now, having been part of both being hired uh, and, and also being on part of the process where we, uh, we are looking to hire other people uh, here at the archives. We brought on a few people in my time here that I've had a role in doing. Um, and we are looking for people with these skills that will match, uh, more so than experience in some cases. We're looking for folks in particular uh, that have people skills. Now that's something that was not traditionally be considered. Um, also training and teaching experience. So any sort of outreach, the ability to talk to other people is an important thing. Um, and I understand not everybody's a natural extrovert such as me, and I, that's, <laughs> I know that, um, but it still is important. You cannot hide in a room and have that be a viable profession anymore. It's just not a way because um, you in many cases will have to defend your field. You will have to uh, advocate for yourself and for your institution regardless of where you're at. And if you can't, uh, if you can't um, express uh, what you need in a, in a way that other people can understand, uh, you will find yourself short. Um, Comfort with technology, of course, that's the, the you know, technical skills are critical. And I think we're aware of that at that point. Um, and also willingness to learn and adapt because if we're stuck on one thing, uh, again, we're not gonna be able to keep up with pace. Uh, next slide, please. So, and to this, this is something I like to say in a lot of my presentations in that the work is not the profession. So we are all members of, or should shortly be members of this greater profession that we call archives and records management or information management or whatever we wanna call it these days. Um, the goal of this profession is to ensure the preservation and access of records for the appropriate period of time. So that doesn't mean that everything is permanent. As Matt said, that's like 5% of records are permanent or less. Uh, but it also means that we help facilitate access to and preservation of records for their whatever li their lifespan may be, because there are a whole bunch of records that live in the gray zone between 10 and 90 years, you know, in that kind of whole big wild west. And those of us that work more on the records management side of it uh, have a major role to play in that to make sure those records are, are preserved for the appropriate period of time. So when I say the work is not the profession, I mean the work is just the task we perform to accomplish that goal. The goal is what we're aiming at. There is a tendency, especially when folks have done a job for a long time, to mistake the tasks they perform for the goal in itself. So they have procedures they follow because that's the way things are done. And they don't always stop to question themselves and say, you know what, I think we're actually missing the great bigger picture here. So we always want to be asking, is this task actually serving our goals anymore? Or is this something we can move on? Uh, and this is not to say we're just going to burn everything down and start over. Expertise built over years and, and the folks that work there have been doing this for decades have a lot of valuable knowledge that we need. I rely on that. I often say I don't know a lot about the, the stuff. What I do know is what we need to do to help bring the stuff forward. And so we, I need the people that, that understand the collections, that understand the, the things we're working with um, just as much as they need me to help express that externally. Um, so for us to be able to outreach. Um, but are the tasks actually serving our goals? I do not ever want to be in a situation where we're saying that's just the way it's always been done. So that's critical. Um, don't hew to orthodoxy if it doesn't work. So I know some folks, and I remember this from school as well, some folks are big on this is the, the way things are done. These things are, this is the way it's written in the text. This is how it's supposed to be done. Um, and, and that's great when you have the luxury of time and all the resources you need to do things perfectly. Um, but what I love about government work to some extent is the fact that the very, the very downside that we don't always have the resources we need, that we don't have infinite resources in time, means we have to be creative. We have to do fast and dirty sometimes. We have to do good enough work. It's MPLP at a massive scale. Um, and it's kind of exciting that way because we have an opportunity to make things work even when we're not just handed everything. Um, so that is, that's, that's, for me, that's an exciting thing. Maybe not everybody finds that exciting, but I find it uh, rewarding. Um, we do need to learn to speak the languages of the, of the communities we work with and respect their experience. 
So by this, I mean, I'm frequently having to do outreach for lack of a better term and training for all manner of people at different government agencies that come from very different backgrounds. We have people that, that know it, nothing about records. We have IT people and administrators and HR folks, folks that do work that I don't even understand in the slightest. Um, and I need to be able to convey the importance of aspects of records management to them in a way that means something to them. So it means learning their language. It means I speak half IT, I, I speak half admin, I speak half budget. Um, and nowhere in there do I try to speak records management to them if they don't already understand it or grasp it because that is a turnoff. So again, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a people problem. It's a way in which we have to interact with folks. Um, so uh, that's why I do a lot of things that are not considered archival or records management work. A very little of what I spend my day doing would be considered that. And yet the greater goal is ensuring that these records are preserved properly and get the treatment they need. Um, the one other thing I'd say before I move on, to the last slide here, uh, the next, not last slide, the second to last slide, um, is that best practices, which exist and people love to point to, are great. But you know who writes the best practices? People in our field. We write the best practices, and you might be the part of the next group that writes that next best practice. So always look at that and go, is this still serving us? Is this still going to be the thing that we need? The beauty of this field is it's not that massive, and so you will have a role to play if you want to have a role. Um, are, they are always looking for, if, whether you're at COSA or NAGARA, which is another government uh, records or, um, archivist association I work with, uh, or any of the other asso uh, associations related to different aspects of the field, SA, of course, um, you have an opportunity to have a voice and uh, really engage in that. And government, I particularly, it's a very tight-knit community. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so uh, the beauty of the immaterial is what I call this. So I get asked sometimes, don't I miss the stuff? Because I work, I ba barely work with the stuff. I don't touch records very much. Uh, but what I do is I joke, I work with the stuff of the future. So uh, I am setting the table for the next generation of researchers. And so while I might not, I, people, my current genealogists may not see the work I do, for example, having a lot of value. And folks, when I say I work for an archives, they immediately go, oh, you know, because they immediately go back to stuff they've seen on TV or whatever. That's not what I do, but I am going to do the same thing for the folks in the future. So this is a, a cool thing. Um, I work at the system level, not the record level. So this is another opportunity for folks that um, it's, I am, I'm dealing on, uh, information systems that manage records, because when we start dealing with scale, especially with electronic records, if you start to look at the stuff itself, you're already lost. But impacts are magnified, so you make one change and it can affect millions of records. So if you don't want to get stuck doing the same thing for years, good news, everyone, this is a good opportunity. There are, it's constantly changing, we're constantly having to adapt, um, and you get a chance to solve real problems that impact people every single day. And what's so, uh, uh, What's so exciting about this is that I talk to people that previously barely knew we existed, that certainly didn't give our field respect, and I turn them into advocates for us. Next slide, please. Final slide, I promise. Okay, so uh, last little summation. State archives, uh, opportunities to diversify your skills abound. So they're always looking for somebody to try something new. Um, hey, do you know how to do this? Because we, we never have a specialist for everything. So you get to learn. So I've learned IT. I've learned legal aspects. I've learned how to deal with mobile devices. I've learned social media uh, capture and transparency. I've learned how to handle a, you know, server infrastructure to some extent. Now, it doesn't mean I'm an expert on any of these things, and please don't leave me in charge of all of them. Uh, but you get to dabble in a lot of things. You have a significant impact on society, even if they don't think you do. Um, I personally have a hand in helping agencies provide proactive public access to records through web portals, which is cool. They can access their own records. They never were able to do that before. Um, you get to unleash your creative problem solving, you know, so you, you have 90% of what you need to put it together. You have to come up with that remaining 10% uh, and out of, out of whole cloth. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, there's a great community of government ARM professionals. I have great friends and colleagues that I've known through, through work in this and participating in communities and things. Um, I really love the people I work with both internally and externally. So go state, that's, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Those were three uh, fantastic presentations and uh, what a wonderful opportunity for uh, students considering uh, what they're going to do after they graduate to learn more about different positions within the state archives. Um, I'd like now to open uh, the session to questions. If anyone in the audience has a question, uh, unmute your mic and uh, go ahead and feel free to ask. Yeah. 
while they're thinking, I was wondering if you had any recommendations. I, I know you mentioned uh, uh, COSA and Nagara, Chris. I wonder if any of you have other recommendations for membership in professional associations and how that might be beneficial to you in uh, pursuing a career later on. There's lots of uh, different organizations that kind of overlap. So you'll find some of them you just kind of find when you're in a, in a field, the areas that you need to learn. So I have found a tremendous benefit from learning from, I'm not a member of, but learning from uh, AIM, A-I-I-M. Uh, what's that? Association of uh, Image and... Information and Im Image Thank you. Managers. Thank you. They put out some great resources. They have classes available uh, that have really, I took some information governance classes from them that were great. So they're kind of an affiliated community. Um, there's ARMA uh, for records management um, that is, you know, specific in that field, specific in that track. Um, I'm currently working on uh, on my my certified records management exam, the CRM, which is put out by ICRM, but they sort of exist as a licensing body, uh, so to speak. Um, honestly, I've gotten the most out of COSA and Nagara because it is a community. So COSA, the Council of State Arch Archivists. Um, is a very tight community, and I've been part of their state electronic records initiative since almost since its beginning, which is cool. They have a lot of subcommittees talking a lot about a lot of these issues. Uh, and then NAGARA, which is a broader organization that covers all levels of, levels of government, federal and down to local, um, and has great communities as well. And I've done a lot of work with both of those. Um, and do you two have uh, other ones you've worked with? Well, our our uh, national organization for archivists generally, the Society of American Archivists, oh, while not while not devoted to uh, or or dedicated to government archives, certainly includes a lot of government archivists in it and addresses a lot of the issues related to government archives work. So, uh, so I would always encourage. Um, to young archivists or new archivists to join that organization. And there are there are regional organizations. The Midwest mm -hmm. Archives Conference is the one that's in my region, but there are regional archival organizations across the country that are also very valuable. And you could also, um, Illinois doesn't have a statewide archives association, but um, we have the Chicago Area Archivists. Um, obviously, that's a big population center for us. Um, so even though I you know, I'm about three hours south of Chicago. I'm a member um, just to stay kind of connected with what's going on in the state um, and with the archives community in our state. And I think uh, that's a good point. Sometimes it's difficult to travel to conferences that are national conferences and you have a better opportunity of becoming involved when you look to the local or the regional uh, associations to get started. So uh, that's a good uh, point. Uh, I know that you mentioned uh, AIM, Chris, and uh, they're working on uh, standards now in California uh, having to do with uh, electronic records. So many of these associations do get involved in standards work. And I was wondering if any of the three of you have also been involved in standards work. Yeah, I, I got involved in um, <clears throat> and have continued to be involved in something called the um, the Kansas Electronic Recording Commission that uh, established standards for the state of Kansas for the electronic recording of, of land records, of uh, you know mortgage records and things like that with, with Register of Deeds offices. Um, it was one of those where it's a statutory body and the person writing the statute just happened to be someone who I'd come into contact with. So he added the state archivist to the, the commission and it's been a really valuable, um, valuable tool for me to really for contacts to, to network with people in the, like the title industry and in the mortgage industry and in the banking industry and people that I wouldn't, or, wouldn't ordinarily come into contact with. And uh, it's an opportunity to kind of educate them about some of the archival issues that, uh, that we encounter. That's a, a very good way to take advantage of the people that you meet in yeah. a good way in order uh, to give back. Yeah. You know, I think, I think all three of us uh, probably are, are pretty good at leveraging uh, any conversation and turning it towards archives in one way or another. <laughs> Which is just that outreach that Kathy had been talking about, right? Right. Exactly. No, you go ahead. I was just saying, I too have been involved in, certainly at a state level, uh, crafting rules. So administrative rules, both here in Oregon and Illinois, uh, for electronic records guidance, um, and that's uh, something I was I had the opportunity to do um, extensively in Illinois. Spent a lot of time working on them there, and then also 
uh, a, a little bit here in Oregon. So that's that's pretty neat. Um, and also is an easier way to start than, you know, sometimes after a while you do a couple of those things, the next thing you know, somebody from NARA is ca calling you or people from uh, some of the bigger uh, interstate organizations call and ask if you'd be willing to participate in their white papers or in their standards and best practices. Exactly, and that's such a good way to elevate the uh, image of the professions, uh, the archives and records management profession. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to know if anyone else in the audience has a question. Oh, if not, then what I'm going to do is thank the three of you very much for being here today and presenting for us. Uh, it was uh, a fantastic afternoon.